Uh, so my name is Paul. I am with a company called Platform.sh, where I'm a developer relations engineer. If you're not familiar with us, we are a uh, platform as a service provider. We manage or remove the complexities of cloud infrastructure management. So your development teams can spend less time managing infrastructure and most likely fighting infrastructure, and more time doing what they do best, and that's building solutions. So whether it's one side or a thousand, it doesn't matter the runtime. We can help you maintain standard security compliance across all of them. But that's not why you're here, but I did pay for my plane flight. So we're here to talk about GitHub Actions. Now, in my presentations, I do like to give a series of warnings. So if you're listening to the presentation, um, I've got an animation of a red light flashing to give you a heads up. Uh, one of those is I am not a GitHub Actions expert. And that just reminded me, I forgot to hit the button. So now I hit the button. There we go. Uh, so I'm not a GitHub Actions expert. That said, I have spent the last 18 months building and maintaining a large collection of custom actions for my team at work to automate a lot of the responsibilities that we have. Um, with any, in fact, it's during that time that I was learning the GitHub Actions platform that I came across a lot of areas of frustration and confusion and pieces and parts that didn't quite make sense. And that's really what prompted this presentation. My, my hope is that I can help you navigate around those more frustrating and confusing areas and really jumpstart you on your way to building out your automations. Uh, the next warning that I will give you is that because this is a technical presentation, as with most things in technical aspects, there are a hundred different ways to get from point A to point B. So what I show you may not be the right way for you. Treat it as an inspiration to help again jumpstart you on your way. So specifically what I want to talk about today is I want to talk about what the GitHub Actions, what they are. Uh, we're going to talk about the pieces and parts that make up the GitHub Actions. We'll then dive into one of those, which is referred to as a workflow. We'll talk about the parts that are required for workflows. Then together, we're going to build our first workflow. After that, we'll move into actual custom actions and talk about the pieces and parts that are required for actions. We will then together build our first custom action and along the way, talk about some of those warnings and gotchas that you need to be aware of. At the very end, time willing, then I'm going to show you a real, in-world, in real-world example of a GitHub action in use and that's a little bit more tangible than just hello world type examples. So, ha has anybody worked with GitHub Actions yet? Are they, okay, some of you, okay, not everybody. So GitHub Actions is actually a service provided by GitHub. It is a continuous delivery, continuous integration platform that allows you to automate all the things surrounding your code base whether that's building or testing or deploying or even project management. It just allows you to automate things that touch your code base. Now, there are a lot of pieces and parts to that platform that you're going to be utilizing. These include things like workflows, events, runners, job, jobs, steps, and then custom act or GitHub actions, but with a little a, not a capital A. So if you're listening in, I've got an animation of Jim Halpert from the office saying, wait, what? Yeah, so one of the confusing parts of GitHub Actions is the big A refers to the platform itself. A little a action refers to a modular, self-contained piece of automation that performs a specific task that you can utilize. They are sometimes referred to as custom actions or just actions in the documentation. And that brings you to my next warning about the GitHub Actions platform is that the way GitHub has decided to name certain things can be very confusing such as the big A versus the little a. Another one is the word status versus checks versus the phrase status checks, which are three completely different things. So how many of you, when you're searching for the document in the documentation, search for a particular key word? All right? It can get really confusing if you search for checks and you wind up on status checks, and status checks don't have anything to do with checks. So just be aware if what you are seeing in practice is not matching what you just read in the docs, you might have come across one of these situations. All right, so we got workflows, events, runners, jobs, steps, and actions. How do these things all fit together? Well, we configure our automation in what's known as a workflow file. That workflow file is then triggered by one or more events that run. Though that event then kicks off a series of jobs. Those jobs run on a runner, and the jobs themselves contain one or more steps that are either going to call some action, use an action, or they're going to run some shell script. So I want to dig farther into these components and define them a little bit more. So the workflow is a file. It's where we configure all of our automation. It is a YAML file. 
Um, the name of the file itself does not matter. It can be anything you want. It has, to, but it just has to be a YAML file. But it does have to be stored in a workflows directory inside of a .github directory that sits at the root of your repository. Now, your repository itself can have as many different workflows as you want. Each one being triggered by a different event. They can all be triggered by the same event. However, there's a lot of flexibility so that you can manage this automation in whatever way works best for your situation. The next piece then is an event. It's some activity that is going to happen to or on or surrounding your code base. It's what allows us to tell the Actions platform that, hey, we need to kick off some, some type of automation. Now, they are referred to sometimes as workflow triggers in the documentation instead of events, but you do have a lot. Oops. Grab the wrong button there. Let's try this one. So that's probably a little small. Let me zoom in just a bit here. You can see I've got documentation up right now, and we've got a whole bunch of different events that you can utilize to give you fine grain control over exactly when you want your automation to kick off. Next piece is a runner, simply a virtual server. It's where your job is going to run, or it's the server where your, your steps and your logic are going to run. Uh, now there are public, GitHub provides a collection of public runners that you can utilize, and if you utilize those, you have a choice between Windows, Ubuntu, and Mac OS in various versions, or you can also choose to use your own self-hosted runner. Uh, the one warning I'll give you about the public runners is that because they are publicly available to everybody, there is a chance that when your event triggers, you might not have that run immediately. It might be a few seconds or minutes because there might be a queue in front of you. So just be aware of that. A job then is where your actual automation, your logic, perfect happens. Come on in, we got plenty of room. Uh, it's, inside that job, we have a series of steps. These are the things that we want to have performed. Now it's important to note that your job and all those steps are going to run on a specific runner. We designate that using the runs on property. So inside your job's definition, you're going to say, hey, I want this job to runs on Mac OS, or I want it to run on Ubuntu. Uh, it is important to note that all the jobs that you define in your workflow will run concurrently. They're going to run in parallel. Now, we have the ability to build, to build dependencies between our jobs. By default, they're all going to run at the exact same time. Now, technically, that's why I got a little asterisk there, uh, you can have an unlimited number of jobs uh, in your workflows, but there are some restrictions on how many can run at the same time, how long they can run, how, uh, how long a workflow file can run. So with those restrictions, it might not quite truly be unlimited. So every job has to have steps. The steps are the things that we want to have performed. They have to either be some shell script or command, or we have to designate that we are going to use one of those actions I mentioned earlier. Now, unlike jobs, these are actually executed sequentially in order, and they are dependent one <coughs> on the other. So if an earlier step fails by default, the rest of the steps will fail out. It's also important to note that all of your steps in that job are going to run on the same runner. So you're not going to have step one run somewhere, and then step two run somewhere else. They're all going to run on that exact same server system. An action, as I mentioned earlier then, is just a self-contained modular piece of automation that does a task. The cool thing about actions, though, is that they're kind of like Legos, is that we can begin to utilize these reusable pieces of actions to build out more complex automation tasks that meet our specific needs. All right, so let's talk about a workflow, since that's that main area we're going to do configuration, because it does have some requirements. So a workflow has to have an event. We have to tell the Actions platform in some way the thing that we want to have trigger our automation. So every, every single workflow has to have an event. It then has to have at least one job defined. And in that job, we have to designate the runner. So the Actions platform needs to know when should I run this, what do you want me to run, and where do you want me to run it. Inside that job, then, it has to have at least one or more steps. Should make sense because this is an automation. We're going to have something to do. And those steps themselves either have to then run a shell command or script or use some action. So let's build our first workflow. Now, I did forget to give you one warning, and that is that I expect you to interact with me, and there are pop quizzes. So every workflow has to have what? An event. An event. Okay. Uh, this is where I pause and I give a shout out to JetBrains who makes an amazing collection of IDEs. And inside of this ID, they happen to have 
a GitHub Workflow Builder plugin to help you build this out. So we use the on property to help define the event that we want to use to trigger this automation. In this case, I'm gonna use the event called Workflow Dispatch. The Workflow Dispatch allows us to manually trigger an action whenever we want to, so we don't have to recreate one of the other actions to see this workflow in action. That's a lot of actions all at the same time. Uh, what else do we have to have? A runner. We have to have a runner, and then what, what is running on the runner? Job. A job, so we have to have some jobs. So I'm gonna create a job here. So I'm gonna create a job called say hello. Oops, came down too fast. There we go. And then now we have to have a runner. So we use, did I, can I remember what property we used to say that? Run. Runs on. Yeah, so I'm gonna say I want this to run on Ubuntu's latest. And then what else does that job have to have? We want our job to do something, right? An action. Right. But, oh, an action. And then what, what's that? Steps. steps. We've got to have some steps. steps. There we go. And in that step, I would either then now say use some action, or in this case we'll do one real easy. I'll just say run, and that says run a shell command, and I'll make it be echo hello there, because we all love hello world examples. <clears throat> Do you want to see this in action? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so if you are following along, give your laptop out, you can follow along. I've got, as soon as I find my mouse there, yes? What user is going to be used for that root? It will be, well, it uses its own GitLab runner user that okay. runs in it's there. Privilege user. Right, and so it actually creates a token for that user to use inside while it's running the action. Now there's a whole, that's a whole deep channel that we can go into. Okay. But if you want to follow along, if you've got your laptop out, if you go out to my profile, which is github.com slash gilzo, it's in the upper right, GitHub Actions presentation. If you click on that, let's find my mouse here, then there should be an actions tab. I mean, I don't need to put sudo or something. No, you don't have to do that. Okay. So all of my actions, oh, excuse me, all of my workflows are going to be listed here on the left. <coughs> Currently, the one we're working on is designated by its location and its name, which is first. So if I click on that, you can then see my previous runs. Because we're using that workflow dispatch, I have a nice button called run this workflow where I can trigger it manually. So I'll go ahead and say run the workflow. Workflows that I previously run will have a little green check mark inside of a circle. Once I know it's been picked up, it'll turn to a little dot. Thank goodness the internet is working today. Once I go into here, I can see all the jobs listed out. So there's that say hello job. And if I go into there, I can see there's my step they're in. Yeah, yeah, I was gonna say, you just built your first workflow. That is definitely cause for celebration. That workflow is the first step that you have to take in order to build out custom actions. So great job. All right, so let's dig in some deeper into these workflow components. Because one thing I did that I hadn't talked about was I created a job ID. All right, so every job has to have a job ID. Uh, that ID has to be unique inside the workflow itself and it's limited on what you can use to name it. It has to be alphanumeric or a dash or an underscore, but it must start with an underscore or a letter. Um, inside of that job, then we talked about the steps. The steps are simply an array of tasks. It's important to note that as you're doing these steps, each one is gonna run in a process on its own inside of that runner. Just like if you were to create a new terminal session or run a sub process in some terminal command, same thing, they're all running in their own process. However, because they're all running on the same runner, they all have access to the same file system. That means if a step earlier writes to a file or edits a file, later steps will have access to that same file. Now, as I mentioned, they all have to use the word, the keyword uses to designate to the GitHub Actions platform, I wanna use some action that's reusable, or I wanna run some specific shell command or script. All right, ready to build the second workflow. Yeah, this is where you say yes. yes. Yeah, there we go, okay. Let's build a second workflow. So again, what does every single one have to have? An event, all right. Now, earlier when we looked at all those workflows, it was by file location and file name, and that's not really easy to see as you start getting more of these. So one of the things we can do is we can add a name property to the workflow itself so that this will show up in that list instead of the file name. All right, what else do we have to have? Job, job. We gotta have jobs. And what else? 
the runner. Runner. Gonna have the runner, so we'll say runs on, or I'm gonna have the job itself, sorry. Uh, just like with the workflow, I showed you the jobs, and it was the job ID, but we have restrictions on what we can use in the job ID, so again, we've got this ability to add a name property to be able to see more human-friendly names for each of these jobs. Ah, yeah, so we gotta have the operating, the runner. So I've got a runs on run, uh, runs on Ubuntu latest again. Then we gotta have those steps. So there, I've got that same one I used last time. So let's go ahead and add some more steps. Unlike other CI CD systems that you may have used, uh, GitHub Actions does not automatically check out your repository into the file system when you run one of these jobs. So if you want to utilize or access some of the files in your repository, you have to check it out first. So I'm gonna use a public action called Checkout, and all it does is takes my repository and checks it out in the file system, which then allows me to do something like maybe grabbing, where'd that file go? There it is, list.txt and catting it out. Just display the contents of that file. Now, just like with the jobs and the workflow itself, I have the ability to name individual steps, again, just so that it's easier to find. To what repositories does it have access? Which repositories does it have access? None. It is just a blank file system. Okay. So from here, when you use the so actions it has to be checkout, a public repository. It, well, it's going to, by default, you can immediately check out your own. Okay. Otherwise, it, you would have to have access to it, and you would have to provide a token to access that other repository. Got it. So it's limited to just your repository currently. Okay. All right, so I'm going to cat it out. I'm going to add one more step. You want to see this one in action? Good. All right, that's the right answer. So I'm going to go back up to my actions, and this one is the second one. I, for sake of time, I'm not going to run it. I'll just show you a previous run of it, though. But notice now it's saying welcome to the party. So I've got that nice title instead of the file name. The job is not say hello anymore. It's that nice property name. And then I've got that step saying I display the contents versus just telling me what the step does. And if I open it up, it did actually access that repository and pull out the contents. All right, everybody following along? Still good? Yep. Okay. So now, oh, went too far, too fast. So it is, we've been talking, I forgot how many minutes, about 15 minutes. Is anybody one of themselves, okay, this is supposed to be a presentation on actions, and so far you've spent the last 15 minutes talking about workflows. Is anybody asking themselves that? Nobody? Okay. Sure. Sure, okay, somebody said, yeah, sure, sure, yeah. Okay, there's a reason to that madness, in that can you use an action directly? Does anybody know? No, you can't use actions directly. You can only use an action through a workflow. The workflow is the only way that you can use an action. So even if you created an action, you'd have to have at a minimum a workflow that calls that action. In addition, the reason why I show workflows first is that when you build workflows with the workflow dispatch, there is a huge amount of overlap between it and some of the types of custom actions that we can build. They share a lot of the same components. So by understanding how these components work in the workflow, you automatically understand how they work in actions. So some of the things that they share are gonna be things like inputs. So since our action should be reusable, at some point there's a good chance you're gonna to need to be able to accept some incoming information into that logic. So what we can do is we can define an inputs area and define individual inputs. So they are available to the workflows when you're using workflow dispatch or workflow call. We can then define those inputs we want to accept. And just like with jobs, they're limited. They have to have unique IDs and they're limited to no characters. They have to be alphanumeric dashes or underscores. Now there's some additional properties that we can add and some are required. So inside of an action, the description property for a given input is required. You have to include that. In addition, we can say whether or not inputs are required for that action to run, and we can also set up some nice defaults if we need to. Once we've accepted those inputs, at some point we want to utilize those inputs, and we utilize those using something called an inputs context, which we'll cover next. So let's build out our third workflow using um, some inputs. All right, so I'm gonna quiz you again. What's, what do we have to have for workflows? We have to have an event. What else? Jobs. We have to have jobs. What else? Runners. runners. Got the job and then we got the runners. Good job. And then we have to have steps. All right, so now in this step, I wanna do, some, do something similar to what we did earlier where I say hello, but I wanna say hello to specifically someone. 
I want to have an input, and then I want to say hello to whoever was put in for that input. Make sense? Okay, so we're going to need some inputs. Luckily, that keyword is called inputs. For workflows, when using the workflow dispatch, it's part of the dispatch, so it's a sub-property of that workflow dispatch. We simply give it a name. In this case, I'll just call it the name. I'm going to give it a description, and I'm going to say it's required. Pretty straightforward. All right, so let's go use it. Let's come back over here and go back up to my actions. This one is hidden, so let me open that up. Notice now, if I go to run this workflow, what shows up? Is there a way to set a type for an input? I'll get to that. Okay. Good question. But what shows up? Prompt. A little prompt, like an input. If I try to run the workflow, <coughs> says you can't because I said that particular input was required. required. All right, so let me put in here, let's say Drupal Camp. Oops, Drupal Camp is one word. And I'll put Florida so you know I'm not lying to you. We'll run that workflow. Give it just a second to get picked up. Come on, come on, come on. There it goes. There's that let's greet the user. Starting the job. Come on. Come on, GitHub. There it goes. And sure enough, it said, ta-da! Yay. Yay, there we go, okay. You're a tough crowd, jeez. All right, so if at some point we accept that input, we need to use that input, right? Okay, those are referred to as context. Context are how the GitHub Actions platform provides information to your workflows, to your actions, about what's happening. Whether that is the workflow itself, it could be the jobs, it could be the runner. You have a lot of different contexts that you can use. You have 12 different contexts. Let me zoom in here so it's a little bit easier to read. 12 different contexts to provide you all the different kinds of information you might need, including the inputs context, about what's happening so that you can build out that automation. Let me flip back over. Boop. There we go. Oh, I, mentioned, I forgot to mention one thing. Uh, the types of context may not always be available. So every, what this means is, so there's something called a matrix. If you're not running in a matrix situation, the matrix context won't be available. Or if you didn't define the inputs, the inputs context won't be available. Should make sense, but it's just important to remember, yeah. Can you do uh, saved inputs, like a configuration or something? You cannot. Okay. Not yet. So it's always a manual entry? It's always a manual entry. All right, to utilize context in any situation that when you're not using the JavaScript SDK provided by GitHub, I want to designate that, then you access those contexts via a dollar sign, two curly braces, the context name dot, the property name that you want to use. So earlier in the example, I wanted to say hello to that input. The input's name was the name. So I targeted the input's context and then the property, that ID that I had given it, that's what allowed me to use that. Sometimes, though, those properties are other objects, such as inside the steps context. This would be the property name of the step I wanted to target. It might have an outputs context, and then that might be the property name of the outputs context in that case. Good? Make sense? Yeah. All right. Now, there's a quick warning, and this is an important warning. If nothing else, please remember this one warning, and that is that inputs, or excuse me, context particularly those that store user-supplied input, are not escaped, they're not prepared for you to use directly, which means they are very ripe for script injections. All right, so something like the pull request title. Right? Anybody can, well, not anybody, but depending on how you have things set up, somebody might be able to come and create a pull request, and that user is gonna supply the pull request title. So if I were to try to create a shell uh, variable called title equals quote, that context, in quote, and in their pull request title, they made it a double quote semicolon. That is a complete and ended shell command, which means if it would get dropped in and become quote a double quote semicolon, some command, and then the rest of my stuff, which means they would be able to execute whatever they wanted. Now, there's many ways to prep that. I'm not going to go into that because that's a much deeper conversation, but please remember that you can't just drop these in directly. The system isn't going to escape them for you. All right, so if we've got inputs, we've used the inputs, there's a good chance we need to output information or send information back to a step or calling workflow. So 
we are able to, inside of our workflows, inside of our steps, inside of our actions, define outputs that we want to send back to those calling pieces so that they can be utilized in later steps. To set an output, again, as long as you're not using the JavaScript SDK, you do it echoing out the property name that you want to set equal to the value and then redirecting that to the environment variable called GitHub output. If you're using the JavaScript SDK, then they make a nice little method for you just called set output. But the effect is, is the same in either case. Let's look at the outputs real quick. So I'll hop back over to my IDE. This one I'm not going to type out, I'm just going to show it to you. The top is exactly the same as previous times. We got We've got our event, we've got our runner, we've got our job ID, we're saying hello, et cetera. But now in the second step, I'm going to grab the current timestamp and save it to a variable. I'm going to set a current time property name equal to that captured value, set that out as an output, and then in step three, access that information that was set as the output. Show it to you real quick in use. Oops, sorry. Come back over to my actions. And this is, should be, let me know what time it is. I'll just show you this one for the sake of time. There's my say hello. I can see I've set that current time, sent it to the output, and then that last step, now I'm able to access that timestamp. Now you might be saying, okay, that's fine, but couldn't I just get the timestamp in the third step? Why do I gotta save it in the second? Number two could be an action, right? That could be an action that I'm calling, and that action is returning some value. And that's why it's important then to see how I can access that earlier return value in later steps. All right, good. Well, let's keep going then. And now we are finally prepped to talk about custom actions, but not custom actions with a capital A, with a lowercase a, because that's what refers to those actual custom actions. All right, we have three types of custom actions we can build. We can do Docker, we can do composite, I skipped one, JavaScript or composite. The difference is in with a Docker composite, with the, ah, I mixed up all my words. With a Docker custom action, if you have particular specific environment requirements in order for your action code to run, this is gonna be the type that you wanna use. So you can designate a Docker image, you can have the JavaScript actions, no, excuse me, the GitHub actions platform build up your container and then run your actions code. The other type is a JavaScript-based JavaScript custom action. This allows you to separate out that action code from the environment that's running on, which can, which can make it easier to test. Uh, it's often faster than a Docker-based one because you're not having to build a container. It's already got a place where it can run. Uh, one of the downsides, though, is if you want to use somebody else's custom action inside of your custom action, if they haven't exposed that code as a JavaScript package that you can then require as one of your dependencies, you can't use it. Which is why the third type exists, composite. Composite allows you to build, very much like with Legos, other people's custom actions inside of your custom action and utilize those to build out that unique action or that unique automation that you need. The downside of it is it can, it is gonna run on a runner and some of the executables in that runner may not be the version that you need. So suddenly you find yourself having to update or upgrade those different versions. And at some point if your action is more of upgrading versions of binaries, you might need to switch back to a Docker type. Now actions themselves are stored either in a repository all by themselves or you can store them in an existing repository, but they must be stored in a directory of their own inside that repository. Actions do have specific components and pieces that are required. Every custom action must have an action metadata file. It has to be named action, and it has to be either YAML or YAML, three or the four extension. It has to be in the root of where that custom action is being stored. So if it's in a repository all by itself, it has to be in the root of the repository or it has to be in the root of that directory if you're storing it in an existing uh, repository. The metadata file itself must contain at least a name, bless you, a description, and a runs property with a runs on sub property, excuse me, runs using sub property uh, to designate the type of custom action we're building, whether that's Docker, JavaScript, or composite. Now in addition, we can also define inputs for that that custom action to accept, as well as outputs that it's going to send back. Now I have a little asterisk here next to that. 
because depending on the type of action you define, composite, Docker, or JavaScript, you will have additional sub-properties that are required for you to define. So let's take a quick look at an example custom action. So here we've got to have a name, so we've got name, greet to user. We got to have a description, read to user, blah, 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 blah. We got to say runs and using. In this case, I'm saying node 20 to designate that it's a JavaScript based custom action. And then I have to have another property called main to indicate to the actions platform where my entry file is or that entry point is. That's main.js. Now, I'm going to give you a quick warning about the three types. When you are defining the type that you're using with runs using, for Docker and composite, it is actually the words Docker or composite. For JavaScript, you designate the version of Node that you want to use. However, they only support Node 20 right now. Support for 16 was dropped in October or something. They might support Node 22 this spring, we'll just see, but for now your only option is Node 20. One of the other disadvantages of JavaScript-based custom actions is that you must commit the entirety of your Node modules and all your dependencies into the repository or the directory where that action lives, or use something like Versailles NCC to bundle all those dependencies into a single file and then commit that. But basically, all of your dependencies have to be stored and available inside that repository. And as I mentioned earlier, if you're using composite, the binaries program inside that runner, those might be out of date, you might have to update those, but just be aware of that. Are we ready to build an action? Yes, all right, let's build an action. So, pop quiz again, what are some things that are required for actions? Event. What's that? Event. An, oh, an oh, event or? Sorry. That's workflows. They have to have three things. A name, description. Bam, a name, a description, what was the third? Runs. Runs property. with Runs. using, there we go, okay. So we've got Welcome to the party to an action. Welcome someone to our party. We're going to run using. user. We're going to build a composite. Guess what composite has to have as a sub-property? Steps, which is exactly like what? Jobs. All the, yeah, all those workflows we were doing earlier with the jobs, right? So in this case, I'm going to give it a name. I'm going to give it an ID. I can even designate the shell I want to have. Make sure. So I'm going to say I want to make sure i got bash in here. And I'm going to do a quick just little run, just like we did last time. I'm going to echo out, hello, and then an input. So just like we saw earlier, we can do inputs. Now, because I'm in an action, the inputs property is a main or a top-level property. It's not part of the dispatch. It's all the way at the top. But otherwise, it's the exact same. I give it an ID. I have to give it a description. I mentioned that one. I think you asked about types earlier. Yeah. So Custom actions can only have one type for input, and that is string. If you're using inputs with workflow dispatches, they actually have multiple types. But custom actions only get string, but it doesn't hurt to go ahead and put it in here. And I am going to go ahead and designate that it is required. So this is a complete custom action. Can we use it right now? No, we have to have... Workflow. We have to have a workflow, so let's build a workflow. What do we have to have in a workflow? We have to have an event. We have to have jobs. We have to have runner. We have to have steps. Now, and earlier I said, oh, I forgot to mention this part. So this action that we just built is right here. It's inside there. This greet user in a directory. There's the file, that my action metadata file. Now, I personally have it inside an actions directory inside of .github, but it doesn't have to be there. It can be anywhere in the repository. That part doesn't matter. It just has to be in a directory by itself. But to me, it made sense to put it there. Okay, so I have to check out the repository if I want to use that action, because right now I don't have access to that file. So then, the next piece is I'm going to say, okay, I want to use the action that's stored in GitHub Actions Greet User. Makes sense? But what does our action include? It expects an input. So I'm going to use the keyword with to say, when you run this action, I want you to run it with. I'll give it the name of the input that it expects, and then I'm going to give it some value. All right, so use our action. It has an input. I'm going to say with. Here's the input you're expecting. I'm going to give you some value. And what am I doing there? 
pointing back up to an input, right? So our workflow is gonna accept an input. It is then gonna check out the repository, call our action, when it calls our action, takes that input we just accepted and send it over to our action. Are you ready to see it in action? Yes. Yes. Perfect answer. So let's go back here. Let's say, let's see this. Whoops, that's a JavaScript action. We want this one. And let's run this. Just so you know, I'm not lying to you. I'll say Drupal Camp 2024. We'll run that workflow. Hope we get a public runner pretty quick. Come on. There we go. And let's dive in. There's our job. Checked it out. There it is. And did it, let me zoom in so you can see, did it in fact echo out what we wanted? Yay! All right. Come back over. So what have we completed? We've talked about the Actions platform itself, pieces and parts that make up the Actions platform. Uh, we've talked about the workflow, since that's where we do most of our, we do all of our configuration, the pieces and parts that make up that workflow and those that are required. We then built not just our first workflow, but several workflows together. We then talked about the different types of custom actions, as well as the pieces and parts that are required for a custom action, and built our first custom action. And then last, talked about some caveats and gotchas along the way. So does everybody feel successful in those goals? Do you feel at least that you can start, if nothing else, with kind of a basic hello world custom action? Yes. Feel good? Okay, so then the last few minutes I have, which I think are maybe nine minutes left, is I wanna put the, all these pieces and parts together to show you a custom action that it has real world usage. So my team, we manage a lot of what we refer to as templates, one-click installs. So I heard somebody mention earlier about being able to click and you know, deploy WordPress, deploy Drupal. We got the same thing. But my team manages the code base for all those one-click installs. And so one of the things I want to do is when we do an update on that code base, I want to run a visual regression test against the new code versus the production code, what we give out to customers, to make sure that no visual regressions have occurred. Now, is anybody not familiar with visual regression testing? You're not. Okay, so what this does is it goes and takes a screenshot of a site, a production website. Then you have a, a clone or a copy of that site with new code, and then the visual regression test goes and takes the exact same screenshots of that site and then puts them together and dips them and says, are these two different in any way? And if they are, I'm going to warn you about that and give you a report so you can see where those visual differences are. And we want to use this as part of our testing process so that we can make sure that there's nothing going into the code base that we give to customers that we didn't anticipate. Make sense? All right, so I've got just a right, I mean, and this is, we use Umami to do our production website because it doesn't matter, but it gives us a lot of images and stuff. So this is the production website. And we come back over, I'm gonna show you the action itself. Now this is, I did blow this up real big, so I might have to kind of go back and forth. But what are two things a visual regression test has to have? A test and a product. A test, like a production URL, production site, and a test site. All right, so I've got to have at least two inputs. Now, I'll point out real quick, this is my action metadata file. It is sitting in the root of that repository. All right, so I've got a test input and a reference input. And then I'm going to say I'm going to run using composites because I want to utilize other actions in order to build up this action. So I'm going to scroll down just a little bit. What type of input do custom actions have? If I define an input, it is a string. All right, so the problem with that is then any data validation that needs to happen is up to you. And so that's what these next two steps are doing. I'm saying I want you to use some other action, and all that action does is accepts a string and says, does this look like a URL? And then does a quick curl to make sure that it is responding back with a valid server response. So I'm going to say, all right, I want to call that action using my reference URL. Then I do the same thing again with the test URL to make sure that the production site and the test site are up, available, and the things I've been given are URLs. Makes sense so far. All right, Backstop is a JavaScript-based package, so I now need to install Backstop. So I'll do an npm install, get it installed. Now Backstop stores its configuration data in a JSON file. 
and I need to alter that JSON file with the URLs that I was just given so it knows where to go take these screenshots. The fast, easy way to do that is with JQ, or uh, JSON query. It's a binary inside of uh, most Linux operating systems, if you're not familiar with it. But the version that comes on the runner is 1.6, and I wanted to utilize 1.7 because it has some nicer syntax, some sy syntactic sugar. So I'm going to use somebody else's action in order to update back to 1.7. My next step then is to do that update of the backstop JSON configuration data, swapping out my URLs that I was given in the inputs into that configuration so it knows where to run. I then, in the next step, run that reference, which goes out and grabs, takes those screenshots at the production website. Then I turn around and I say, all right, now I want you to run the text. Earlier when I talked about steps, they run are they in parallel or are they sequential? Sequential, and are they dependent on each other? Yes, they're all dependent. If an earlier step fails, all the rest fail out. But notice what I've added here. I said, I don't care if it fails, because if the backstop test fails, it will exit out with a non-zero, which that would normally read as a failure for all the steps. I don't want that, because a failed test is still valid. I still need that information. So I'm gonna say, no, 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 continue on error. I'm then going to run, I'm going to grab, I'm going to suppress the backstop test output because I don't need to see that. I'm going to grab its exit code though, and then based on that exit code, I'm going to set a variable and save that variable out into an environment variable. Why? Well, in the next step, what I want to do is I want to save that test report. So backstop creates a test report for every test it runs. And I want to save that test if it fails. I really don't care if it's successful. Like if it's totally the same, I don't care. So notice here I say, hey, if that environment variable is false, then I want you to run this step. So now it's a conditional step. Again, I'm using an action called upload artifact. What that does is it takes a path into the file system, zips it up, and then attaches it to the calling workflow. So now if that workflow fails, I've got the report attached to the workflow so I can go view it. And then down at the end, I'm saying I want you to always run this step no matter what happens up here. And if that test failed, exit with a one instead of a zero so the step fails in the calling workflow so that I know something happened. Good? This is completely reusable. I'm able to use this with all of these. But can I use this directly? No, I have to have what? Workflow. Gotta have a workflow. So in my, in this case it's Drupal Camp site, in my Drupal Camp repository, I have a GitHub workflow with a workflow. And so I'm saying on pull request, if the pull request is supposed to go into main, I want you to run this VRT job. Now one of the very cool things about platform.sh is we have an integration with GitHub so that when you create a pull request, it contacts us. We then clone the entirety of your production site. So the database, the files, Redis, uh, RabbitMQ, whatever you're using, we take an exact clone of that site and we bring it up as a brand new ephemeral environment. We then lay the, the PR code onto that environment so you have an exact copy of your production environment running with the new code. Once we're done and we're finished, we send that notification back over to GitHub and provide it that ephemeral URL. So that's what this action is doing. It's saying, hey, GitHub, has it returned back with a success message yet? And if it has, grab that target URL and send it out as an output. So you mentioned earlier about uh, can you do certain things. So like with this one, because of the way it's being done, I had to provide a second token to off in as a different user. All right, so then in the last one, I'm now calling that same action that I just showed you. And I'm going to hand it over a test URL because it accepts and it needs that input that comes from here. So this action sets an output of that URL and then grab it here. Because my production URL never changes, you can actually set up variables inside the repository itself in GitHub. And so I'm just going to refer to the variables in my repository and that prod URL. Yes? So for this one, we specify just a couple of pages. This is an earlier version of the one we have in production. The one in production allows you to uh, have a, either the default collection of pages or define your own pages so that every site can have different ones. But for this one, I want it was very simple. So just, just change out the URL but go to these pages. 
So let's see this in action, which I have running. So here is my pull request. I've made some changes. You can see then that the platform part has succeeded. And then if I hover over the details, it has provided, you can barely see it, but it has provided that ephemeral URL that then is passed into this workflow. But this workflow, our visual regression testing, what happened? Failed. It failed. Let's go see why. So let's go take a look. So here we can run down. It says, sure enough, there's that error. Backstop visual regression testing failed. Please see the report. So then if I scroll back up to the workflow, hit the summary here, I can scroll down and there's that artifact that I mentioned. So it has stored the report. I've actually downloaded that already and brought that up over here. And so I had two pass, two failed. I can take a look at the failure here and see, oh, yeah, oh, there we go. Something changed the size of the menu fonts. So here's, here's my production site, here's the test site, there's the diff. And so now inside of GitHub, for that pull request, whoops, come back to the pull request itself, I can actually tell GitHub, hey, I want this to be a requirement of being able to merge. So I can block the merge if any of these tests fail. Good? It makes sense? Yeah. All right, I do not know how much time, I think I have a minute left, but let me flip back over to my slides. Ooh. So I have like a minute left, Howard, I'm gonna go ahead and put up my information so that you can uh, contact me. I will be here the rest of the day, I'll be here for at least the morning tomorrow. I am super easy to find. If you can just remember my last name, there's like 15 or 20 of us in the US and we're pretty much all related. Um, so it's <laughs> super easy. Uh, if not, if you go to link linktr.ee slash gozo. It's got all my social media accounts listed. I'm very easy to find. I geek out on automation stuff. I love this stuff, so I'd be happy to talk to you about it. I really love it. Um, any questions in the last couple of minutes we have before lunch? Will you reply with automatic replies? Will I reply with automatic replies? <laughs> no, I don't, I don't have any automatic replies. No, I don't have any automated replies. So. I'll, I'll respond as a true human. No AI bots or anything. All right. Well, this tool that it compares the screenshots, uh, mm -hmm. can it pass like uh, if there's no certificates on a cell or there's a basic code? Yeah, so it, uh, let me flip back over to Backstop. You can do it, right? Yes, so Backstop, Backstop is very robust. Okay. Uh, its docs are way down here to go. Um, you can say like ignore specific sections of the page, <laughs> wait till a specific element is on the page. There's you can get really fine grain with how you want that to run. Can okay, submit a form or log into the site? It does not do end-to-end -end testing. It is purely visual regression yeah, testing. Okay, if you right. need to do more end-to-end, -end, I would suggest like Cypress. And Cypress is another fantastic tool to do end-to-end, -to -end, which we also utilize to do exactly what you're talking about. Submit some forms, log into the site, kind of create something, kind of navigate. Yeah, we were running Behat. Yep. Oh, Behat, same thing. Yeah. Cool. Any other questions? If not, then you're free to go grab some tacos. Yeah.